Well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you about uh, Captain Burke. Um, hopefully, I'll make this work right. Uh, I learned yesterday that uh, uh, laser pointing doesn't work, so if I happen to walk over there to try to point out something, uh, the, the laser kind of uh, goes into the screen so you don't get the benefit of it. Um, well, uh, Robert Sanders Burt was a North Carolina-born Georgia-trained land surveyor. He came to Arkansas in the 1840s, probably encouraged by a brother-in-law, William Browning, a fellow surveyor who had been in Arkansas since about 1833, settling in with his family in Clark County. On the 18th of December in 1849, Burke married an Indiana immigrant by the name of Elizabeth Ann Morrow, and uh, they settled west of the meandering Mazarn Creeks. This is one of the original uh, land, copy of the original land patents. Uh, this one happens to be signed by uh, President Pierce in 1854, and uh, so. Uh, they settled there, and then uh, Burke was a uh, surveyor, trained in Georgia, like I said. And the uh, story has it in the family that uh, he came out here with a group of land surveyors from Georgia to survey out the township and range lines that were still unfinished in the 1840s. And uh, on the little trifold over there, uh, there is a map from, I think, 1844 that shows some of Montgomery County still unsurveyed. So, you know, but there's no documentary proof, but, you know, family tradition says that's what got him out here. Um, he uh, was elected surveyor of Montgomery County, 1852 to 1866, and he familiarized himself with the local topography. The uh, yellow outline is what the original Montgomery County looked like. It's not like that today, but when Robert was here, and that's the original uh, layout. And while he was there, he secured for himself about 480 acres. This is Polk County, but in this uh, area of Montgomery and Pike, um, it's, uh, and the uh, d legal descriptions and all of that uh, are over here on the, uh, on the board if you wanted to investigate it further. After the Union forces took Little Rock, Governor Flanagan issued General Order Number 6 on the 16th of September in 1863, calling Southern Arkansas militias into service, including a group of 24 Montgomery County mounted volunteers. From December 1863 to June of 64, the unit mustered 72 men. They were aged 15 all the way to 55. 42% of the unit were boys 15 to 18 years old, uh, you know, prior to the conscript years. At least 28 of these men had been members of three other Confederate units, 1861 to 63, now back home, some wounded for whatever reason, but then they joined uh, Burke and his unit. The men elected citizen soldier Burke, their captain, on the 28th of December in 1863. Their mission, so says Major General T.C. Heinemann, was to uh, more effectual annoyance of the enemy, so General Order Number 17 says. But basically, what they were doing was just defending their homes and property against these uh, Union invaders. Area folks supported uh, 
the Home Guard effort. An elder by the name of Thomas Welch, who was the Bethel Baptist Church pastor, accounted for food supplied from May of 1864 through January of 65 for 351 men and 326 horses of Burke's company at 25 cents a meal. On one occasion, uh, documents tell us that 25 of his men, it says, brought in their blankets and slept on the floor of Dr. Alexander Klangman's home. This was five miles north of Amity, Arkansas. As neighbors chose sides, fragile friendships were often tested. Some of them failed. A decade after the war, Richard Burke, the couple's oldest child, wrote, and this is a quote, my mind very readily reverts back to a time when one of our nearest neighbors in whose friendship we had previously placed a bounded confidence brought to our house a squad of northern bloods belonging to General Steele's army for the purpose of capturing my father and sending him to a northern prison as they did other men in the community. Paul was warned of their approach and concealed himself in the yard. Failing to find him, they took all of our horses and left. Paul pursued on foot, got ahead of them, fired on them, and with deceptive strategy, scared them so badly that they took the brush, leaving their guns and horses in the road. He recovered all his horses and one of theirs to boot. He shot the treacherous neighbor in the shoulder. Well, Melinda Jones Cubage confirmed this action, or one very similar to it, praising the legendary Home Guard commander, she writes, it was not more than one mile from grandfather's, this is that Dr. Klingman that I mentioned, from his house to the forks of the road where Captain Burke fought a battle one night, single-handed against seven men and run them off. She added, he was the hero of more than one battle of that kind. Well, because of such an affray prior to his father's attachment to the Confederate Army, Richard Burke opined, Paul was forced to lie out in the woods and see his premises watched night after night. It required the greatest prudence to convoy food to him without detection. I wonder if Richard, the oldest son, was the prudent one trying to avoid the Union forces. Well, um, there is Burke's company coverage. Adversarial respect also enhanced Captain Burke's reputation. John N. Jones, a reluctant Confederate private turned Union Cavalry Lieutenant, remembered various missions in pursuit of Burke. And uh, a copy of the front page of the book is over there on the board with the first page of the chapter that says, in pursuit of Burke. All through Montgomery, Pike, Clark, and Hot Spring counties, so this area in there. Uh, Jones also recalled movements of two other rebel home guard commanders. Uh, their names were Captain John Connolly and Captain Joe Head. On the 31st of January in 1864, Burke's company began following tracks south of the Washita River. That's the blue line through the map. It was Jones on a recruiting scout through Clark and Pike counties. So here, you know, one of their patrols was to go recruit men who were sympathetic to the Union to join their forces. Though 125 miles behind enemy lines, so we're talking about, you know, from Little Rock, South, John and his brother Joe and their detachment recruited Union volunteers. All through that area while evading capture, the brothers even took time to visit their mother, a Mrs. Melinda Ewing Jones, 
and their brother, Private Alfred Jones, who was a member of Captain Burke's volunteers, also appeared at home at that time. So Mrs. Jones, according to John, insisted no trouble around her supper table. You've got two Union brothers and one Confederate brother all at home at the same time. She was, quote, overjoyed to see us, John writes, laughing, friendly, and joking with one another. The better supplied Union brothers gave Confederate Alfred a pair of boots, a hat, a gun, and blankets. But when he asked for lead and gunpowder, they refused. Avoiding rebel Captain Burke, Connolly, and Head, members of the Union recruiting scout regrouped as they withdrew north to what John calls the Rock. Of course, back to Little Rock is what he's talking about. Later, Burke's company was spotted near the Gap. Lieutenant Jones and a small scouting patrol set out to find them. Since only 10 of his men were armed and the new recruits had no weapons, Jones hid them in the brush, deciding to continue the search alone. But he was joined by his brother Joe, who insisted on going along. Fording a river and passing a mill, the Jones brothers uh, encountered two old men and some boys, John says. Asked if they had any knowledge of any scouts from either side, the two men said they hadn't. Asked if they knew where Burke was camped, the boys said they didn't. Later, Second Lieutenant Jones learned that Burke's men were camped within a half mile of the road that they had just traveled. Once the brothers left the mill site, a runner was sent alerting the men that two Federals had been at the mill inquiring for them. Burke's men then retreated about six miles into the mountains, awaiting their absent captain's return. Well, he came back, found them hiding, restored them to their mission, and shamed them for letting the sight of two men run them in, Burke says, hiding out like a wolf from hounds. Burke and two others then hid near the road. Their objective was to take Lieutenant Jones prisoner, but the seizure was aborted when Jones rode by, accompanied by his detachment. Jones put his own spin on that episode in his book. He says, Burke was lying under a little holly tree not more than 20 feet from the road. What a capture I could have had. Well, of course, each man felt that capture of the other would be quite a prize. Jones reported the federal main body finally got to the gap and put out their guards. Burke ran onto them, and there were several shots passed, so Jones says. Well, here, Jones also praises his Confederate opponent, saying Burke was a brave man. One evening... Jones awoke and noticed someone after a loose horse. As the man caught the horse, Jones turned to one of his comrades and said, the silhouette put me in mind of Burke. The other soldier answered, you have Burke on the brain. The next morning, Jones' men discovered six horses and halters missing, along with several of their own hats. Burke and company had slipped through their picket lines, took their hats, and stole what Joan says the best nag in their unit along with five others. In late March or early April of 64, Burke's company skirmished with federal troops along the Little Rock to Murfreesboro Road, some distance west of Fair's Mill on the Washita River still looking for where Fair's Mill. I haven't found it yet. Lieutenant Jones was traveling west on the same road. Their mission was to safely escort Union-appointed Arkansas State Representative John Pretty 
from his Montgomery County home between the two Mazarin Creek, there's Big Mazarin and Little Mazarin, and his home is in between. And if you'll notice, something I, I don't mention, that maroon color was the land where Burke owned. So, you know, fairly close neighbors, but uh, Pretty had been elected to go to the 15th General Assembly in Little Rock. Well, after crossing the Washita, Jones Company stopped around noon at Fair's Mill, and down the road, they saw a group of men headed toward them. With F Company Captain William Warner's permission, Jones and 10 men uh, approached these men. The men happened to be one-year federal troops with whom Jones had previously uh, served, so he knew them. And they told him that uh, they had had a skirmish with Burke's company that morning, and one of their comrades, a man named John Kane, had been killed. The men were welcomed into the company, and the mission continued on with no rebel interference. Near sunset, Captain Warner and most of F Company and the new men stayed at a place called the Widow Furley's as, and John spells it F-E-R-L-E-Y. I found F-A-R-L-E-Y, but, you know, back then, Widow Furley. Jones and ten others then went five or six miles further to Pretty's home. Pickets were posted around 200 yards out, he says, then under cover of darkness, a very skeptical Mrs. Pretty led the lieutenant to a large thicket about a half mile from their home. Well, after Jones' close encounter with a double-barrel shotgun, followed by John Pretty's expressed fear of suffering a fate similar to John Kane, the three heard gunfire coming from the house. Well, they hurriedly returned, and they heard from the pickets that two men had ridden up, shots were fired, you know, they challenged them, and the men fired on them and left. Previously reluctant, now Representative Pretty joined his escort patrol, regrouping with the company. They spread down their blankets that night at the Widow Furley's. The next morning, Lieutenant Jones and five others formed the advanced guard for the company's return to Little Rock. Near the Saline River, the six men spotted a rebel company ahead of them. With guns blazing and men yelling, he says, Jones' men charged with such a war hoop that several rebels dropped their guns and hats as they fled the scene. The balance of the trip was uneventful, and Representative Pretty arrived safely in Little Rock. So, mission accomplished. Was the rebel company they encountered under Burke's command? Jones doesn't say. But no doubt, Burke was the one that he feared most, regardless of this particular incident. Jones told the major he was not willing to go with less men than it would take to whip the great Burke's company. His men and horses once even swam a swollen Washita River just to avoid Burke confrontation. But when the initiative belonged to Lieutenant Jones, he took it. Sometime after the 11th of April in 1864, Lieutenant Jones and a large contingent of men traveled the Washita Mountains, and they traveled the crest near the Gap. And you can tell about the terrain here, uh, uh, Cabot Gap. And so Jones calls it the Gap. One of Jones' men saw someone watching from the mountaintop. And if you've ever been to Kattegat, right there at the place where it has the draw, it is really steep in that area. When spotted, the lone lookout ran for his horse. Jones fired. The horse fell. The man was Captain Burke. Jones pursued, but to no avail. 
During the chase, Jones reported bushwhackers wounded two or three of his men pretty badly. For several weeks, Burke was temporarily inactive and gravely ill. Had Jones only known his location, what do you think, you know, what then? Well, his son writes in his journal, Pa took typhoid fever on a fatiguing campaign and lay within 25 miles of home for weeks that he was not expected to live. Ma waited on him till he was able to be up when she came back home to us and took typhoid fever herself. Pa, hearing that she was very low, rode a few miles each day till he reached home, fatigued, sorely fatigued. On the captain's first day back home, one of his men reported that some feds would make a raid through the settlement that night. The feeble, tired, and anxious husband then left his sick wife's bedside to once again lie out in the woods. Richard continues, the feds came sure enough, and so certain were they that they had pounced down upon the hated rib, they searched every nook and corner. Once convinced Captain Burke was not around, the Union Patrol, according to Richard, oops, robbed us of everything they could carry away and even took my mother's only good pair of cards while she begged with all the pathos she could command. On a scouting patrol from Little Rock through Hot Springs along the Murfreesboro Road, led by Colonel Horace Moore, Jones was the rear guard commander. Crossing the Catter River some distance below the gap, Jones says, they rounded a small mountain just before Captain Burke's Caney Creek home. The advance guard encountered Burke's company resistance and the Union bugler was wounded. Jones reckoned himself to be about a half mile behind. As they passed the Burke's barn, he stopped the soldier, he says, coming with a chunk of fire, and Jones found that the would-be Union arsonist understood that the bugler had been killed. They ought to burn up everything on the place, the soldier spouted. Well, Jones ordered him to mount, catch up with the command, or be reported. Then he noticed a horse tethered at Burke's front gate. So he spurred his horse, rode through the open gate right up to the door. Inside the house, he heard Mrs. Burke quarreling with a man over more threats to torch the place. Jones reported to this man the Union 7th Corps no burn order, and he added that they were not to make war on the women and children, and the soldier ought to be ashamed of himself. Well, Jones had known Elizabeth when they were young, but he hadn't identified himself. So when she sees him, she says, you put me in mind of J.N. Jones that I knew when we were young. You have a good memory, Mrs. Burke, Jones replies. After the Union Regiment passed his home, Burke came out of hiding. Concerned about his family, he asked Elizabeth how the feds had treated them. Had it not been for the man in charge of the rear guard, she explained, everything would have been burned. Well, though area homes were spared, the Bethel Baptist Church building and the Browning gin house and cotton press were, quote, burnt down by Federals during the war. According to Burke's nephew, a man named James Nathan Browning, only 15 years old at the time, Jim served as a picket guard substitute for his brother Jack in Captain Reed's company stationed in Arkadelphia. Browning, who was by this time a successful Texas Panhandle lawyer, returned in May of 1887 to his boyhood home visiting Uncle Bob and other family. One journal entry of his says, the sign of the fire on the trees that stood near the old church is still plain to the eye. Well, Burke must have been encouraged in his efforts to protect local life and property as uh, more men joined his company. He successfully recruited an additional 33 men in May and June 
1864, having lost only one man, a young private by the name of J.M. Bowles, who had, according to his muster roll over there, deserted and joined the Federals on the 7th of April, 1864. From the 5th of September to the 30th of October, the men that were a part of the new 3rd Regiment of Arkansas Cavalry. Then they were assigned Confederate service as Company B of Colonel Robert Newton's 10th Arkansas Cavalry Regiment. At the war's end, several men moved away, but those who stayed reunited on occasion. The Amity Town Square hosted one of those reunions. And there's about 22 or 23 of the men out of the 72 that served in his company. More frequent social gatherings occurred at area churches. On one occasion, John Jones accepted an invitation from Dr. Klingman. He doesn't identify the congregation, but Klingman's granddaughter, Melinda Cubage, told how Captain Burke and Elizabeth were baptized into the Christian church at Catagap soon after the Civil War. Perhaps this was the Klingman Jones destination. Well, somewhat fearful still, J.N., that's John Jones, J.N., strapped on his two 44 six-shooters and accompanied Klingman to the church meeting. Upon arrival, he unbuckled his pistols and fastened them to the saddle before starting toward the church. Who do you think should be walking out of the church? It was none other than Captain Burke himself. Jones observes, tears was running down his cheeks. J.N., if I was ever proud to meet a man, it's you, Burke said, gripping Jones' hand while pausing to gain his composure. You may think different about me, but I've come to know you. Burke's humility shows as he shared how he had been ordered to protect that part of the country but that Jones had done more than he, having served many, you know, saved many a house from being burned after the Union bugler was wounded. The two men may have missed the church services because Jones says in his diary how they talked until church broke. Makes you think they may have never gone inside. Well, enjoying a good laugh, it's, he says, over Jones shooting Burke's horse out from under him. After church, Jones visited his mother and shared the Burke encounter. He told her how flattered and proud he felt when Burke said, if you've ever done anyone dirty, you covered it up well because I've never heard of it. That's the highest compliment I ever heard a man get from his enemy, his mother replied and you don't feel half as proud as I do, she concluded how you have lived under all you've had to go through and get such praise I can't see for my life. Well, peacetime then finds Captain Burke, Elizabeth, and their still growing family farming in a new location 17 miles from the original homestead. William Browning, Burke's surveyor brother-in-law, had passed away in 1854. On the 28th of August of that year, Clark County Probate Court appointed Robert and Mary Browning, his widowed sister, executors. In 1857, Mary marries John Stegall, one of Burke's men, Burke's company. Then in 1866, this blended Browning-Stegall family leaves for Cook County, Texas leaving the former Browning residence to Robert and his family. In 1873, a part of Colbath Township in Clark County, site of the old Browning home, became Clark Township of Pike County. And Captain Burke then finds himself serving a short time as Pike County surveyor. So pre-war Montgomery County surveyor 
post-war Pike County surveyor. Occasionally, though, he goes back to Montgomery County to visit his in-laws. And this is Richard and Levisa Mara, the aging parents of Elizabeth. Thrown by his snake-spooked horse, the legendary home guard hero, Robert Sanders Burke, suffered a fractured hip. He died on the 13th of November in 1894, having contracted pneumonia after the fall. Burial was next to family and friends in the original Bethel Church Cemetery, which is today just a grass-covered pasture northeast of Glenwood, Arkansas. Are there any questions? Ask who did all this research? What? Yeah. Yeah. So how long did it take you to do it? Oh, it, it just uh, I'll, close to a year. You know, it just um, but. I enjoy it. So, and, and what about the survey instruments? Where did they come from? Captain Burke's uh, youngest son, his name was William Parm Burke, who was named after a major, a Confederate major, who uh, one of the teachers at St. John's Academy here in Little Rock, uh, a Masonic friend. Well. Uh, William Parm then, being the youngest son at home, when dad died in 94, he ends up getting the surveyor's instruments. All right, now, so Parm then, when he passes, his oldest son, Dewey Burke, who was a Little Rock machine shop operator, gets the instruments. Dewey and his wife have no children. So one day, Dewey calls me and says, I got something I want to show you. And he showed me those two surveying instruments. He said, now, what do you think we should do with those? Well, he knew my interest in, in history and, and you know, spreading the word. Uh, so much to the uh, aggravation of some of my relatives, uh, I donated the instruments to the old state house. So that's the provenance, I guess is the 50 cent word, that, you know, uh, coming down to today. Is that how you get interested in Robert Burke is through the instruments, or how does your interest fall there, please? Came first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Nineteen sixty five sitting next to my bedridden grandmother with all these old pictures and tin types and such as that and we start going through them and I said who's this fellow well that's Robert Burke your great grandfather uh, and uh, so uh, I, I just caught the bug I guess for genealogy and local history and uh, the rest is history <laughs> Yeah, but he's he's my great grandfather. Yes, sir. Surveyors back in those days, was they someone to look up to, or you just got an interest in this one? Was they someone to look up to back in the right. day? In, <laughs> sure. I mean, uh, in the uh, '60s, right after graduation from high school, and I'm a college student, and uh, uh, you'd have to know some more of my family background to know that, uh, uh, yeah, when, when they start talking about this fellow and start telling stories about, you know, he, he was a good man and he, even one of his enemies says he's brave, you know, and then not only this incident, but there was a couple other incidents where it says he would reach out and he, he was a, kind of a touchy-feely type, you know, he, he was like with Jones, with his enemy reach out and touch somebody and then tears the, oh, I, the, uh, the nephew Browning, the 
Texas lawyer that comes and visits. In his journal, he says, Uncle Bob <coughs> grabbed my hand and with tears in his eyes said, we'll probably never see each other again. So, you know, he had a heart right? and like telling the enemy, he saved more houses than Burke did when that Union bugler was winning. So, yeah, he, he's a, and I think he was a man to look up to. Uh, Forty years old when he got elected over these guys that were either young boys, 15 to 18, or <coughs> men who had already weathered the war in other places. And his muster roll up here on the board, I also wrote the names of the other units that those men belonged to, other Confederate units. But some of them were wounded, they come back home, but they still had to defend their home. So they joined Burke's company. Who, who was they surveying for, the government or uh, county? Yeah, the, yeah. What, what, yeah. what got him out here, family legend has it, he was trained in Georgia as a surveyor just about the time that the Indian removal started out there. And I'd, I'd love to sometime go back and try to figure out, you know, was he one of those that Georgians that were trying to get the Indians out? But he, you know, trained in Georgia, comes out here with a federal survey party to survey this township and range line, gets elected the county survey. And, uh, you can go to Montgomery County and look at some of their archives, and it'll have Robert S. Burke or R. S. Burke, C. S. County Survey. So some of those, you know, county elected, but maybe federal government got him out here to begin with. Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. You might also notice on his stone up there, he was a personal friend of Albert Pike, you know, in the Masons, but that wasn't a part of this presentation.